So uh, I am uh, delighted to have the opportunity to talk to you a little bit about our one blockade in systemic JA. Um, I think the question about the definition of what we mean by, by what, what, what it means to call a disease a, J, a form of JA uh, brought uh, to highlight the important issue that there are many things that are different about SJA compared to other forms of JA. However, it is in most cases an A. It is in most cases an arthritis disorder. And I think it's important to focus that the things we heard about this morning were principally about the MAS and hyperinflammatory consequences. But that is, and that is an important part of disease. It is not the only part of disease. And I think as we think about, uh, it seems to me that the field has gone headlong in the direction of thinking about this as an auto-inflammatory disorder. And what I, my, my purpose here is to push back a little bit and say, pause, is that really what we mean? And how should we think about this a little differently? So the title of this talk is uh, Think Outside the Auto-Inflammatory Box. So for me, this story started when I was interviewing for fellowship. And so I was walking with my now mentor, Rob Sundell, a esteemed clinician. Not this child. I don't have the picture of the child we actually saw. This is from the a website. But, the, but the, it was a child who had a four-year-old child with intractable systemic inflammation, had rash and fever soon after birth, was steroid-dependent, had growth failure, had these are knees with still very remarkable bony overgrowth, chronic meningitis, hearing loss, blindness, mental compromise. And he asked me, so... What auto-inflammatory, what, what autoimmune disease is this? And I said, I don't know. And he said, OK, well, I don't know either. Um, and so, so uh, but in the question, there was an assumption. And the assumption at the time, this is late 90s, was that an immune-mediated disease was an autoimmune disease. That is, a disease in which you have defective self-non-self discrimination. That was the paradigm that was there when I was in medical school and was also even there in the late 90s. And so, it was just at that time that this auto-inflammatory revolution was coming to bear. So the first publications in 1997 describing the association of the mutations in the pyrin gene with familial Mediterranean fever from the Castro group and from a French group. And then shortly thereafter, sort of as, we, as an isolated example, a little bit against the paradigm. And then two years later from the Castro group, uh, the description of familial Hibernian fever being defined, being derived from a mutation in TNFR1, so a, cl and a classic immune-mediated innate immune pathway. The, the Castro group initially found that the FMM, MEF gene was in neutrophils, so non-adaptive immune lineage, and then the TNFR1 was a classic innate immune pathway. And this led to really a, a paradigm-shifting view that said that immune-mediated disease does not mean it's not always self-non-self -self mistakes. It could arise through a general failure of the immunological breaks. And this is the birth of the auto-inflammatory disease idea. And in a way, if you think about that, that's totally obvious, blindingly obvious, in fact. So if you look at evolution, this is an evolutionary tree starting uh, here in 900 million years ago to us in mammals. So Diversity generation, so T and B cells, antibodies, start with the jawless fishes. It starts here. But these guys, who still build up most of life, um, still have to defend themselves. And the way they do it is via innate immune pathways. Phagocytes complement antimicrobial peptides, pattern recognition receptors. There's a whole ways that don't require recumbent combining T and B cell receptors to get an immunological response. And so our assumption, for some reason, we were living with the assumption that immune disease comes from here, but why shouldn't it come from here, or at least some other non-antigen-specific immune pathway? And so it's clear that as these diseases started to emerge, they tend to have a fingerprint, a pattern. So they have fever is very common, rash is common. These are, uh, there's no female-male difference. Uh, they tend to be early, and the severe ones are very often early in the first year of life. There are no autoantibodies. There are no HLA associations. And for many of them, there was a key role of, the IL of IL-1 and or at least in some way the inflammasome. And so when Virginia Pasquale published her paper in JX Med showing that anakinra in patients with systemic JA uh, oops, gave you improvements in the fever, I should say, if I could back up, um, uh, big, I still didn't do that, they had big improvements in fever and some improvements in arthritis, it became clear that, auto, that systemic JA might be a disease like this. That is, it. it has fever at rash. There's no particular gender skewing. It has early onset. It's the only form of J that really occurs with any frequency in the first year of life. There are no autoantibodies. At that time, there was no HLA association. And there was, uh, and there was a, the now a key role of the inflammasome. So SJA looks like an autoinflammatory disease. 
And so this is a great quote from Scott's editorial in 2014, which says, we, mo we may know just enough about cytokines and autoinflammatory diseases to be dangerous. And I think that that's true perhaps here. So the paradigm for treatment of an autoinflammatory disease is this. You figure out what the broken pathway is, you patch it in some way, and then the patient gets better. And so, for example, that patient that uh, we talked about, I showed at the beginning, was from uh, uh, goldbach mansky's paper showing in a patient with neonatal onset multisystem inflammatory disorder, the effect is cryopyrin, which is involved in the inflammasome production. You block IL-1, the child gets better. It's a, a triumph of sort of molecular medicine in a way. But this paradigm doesn't work that well in systemic JAA. So, this has emerged gradually over the course of several studies and several papers. So this is the one from Marco Gotorno looking at the IL-1 response in systemic J. And he showed that in these 22 patients treated with anakinra that there were 10 complete responders, but there were a lot that were not complete responders. And they argued that this was maybe two different subsets of disease. Similar results were published by others. It gets even more tricky when you get to the, random, the only randomized controlled trial of anakinra in this disease, which is by Cartier. And they, here they took 24 children with systemic JAA, mostly had disease for a while, I mean disease of 3.7 years, randomized to anakinra, and had a really low bar, which is a modified PDACR30, that is no fever plus a 30% improvement. And even with that, only eight of 12 patients hit it. Nobody got into remission. There were only five with an ACR 70% response. So when you then open labeled, most of the rest of the patients did respond, but the responses were all pretty underwhelming. So it's not clear that you can take a single pathway and fix it and make the disease better, not least in everybody. Um, and there are other reasons, I think, if you look at the disease clinically, that there are reasons to worry about this classification. One, it, it, although it does occur in infants, it does, it does not occur in early infants. So there's no, there are very few patients with less than, with, who have a disease at less than six months of age. Heritability is not so clear. You don't see sibling pairs or twin pairs that are reported with it, for instance, principally. The disease evolves in phases. So we know that some patients are monophasic. They have a single episode lasting less than 24 months. Some have another episode, a pause, another episode. That's polyphasic. And about 50% are persistent where the disease is chronic and intractable. That's a terrible, awful disease. As we know, um, not everybody goes there. And in many cases, there's this other phasic, which is even more impressive. That is, there's this early inflammatory phase, which is systemic, and a later arthritic phase. And you may have patients who leave the inflammatory phase at least partially behind and transition to this arthritis phase, which really isn't, we don't see this much in the, auto, in the classic auto-inflammatory diseases. Uh, Mike Umbrello recently showed that there was an HLA-2 association. So HLA-2 is, is normally involved in CD4 T-cell selection. There are ways you can get around that. It doesn't have to be T-cell mediated, but that's the, the prima facie interpretation of what a finding like that means. And then one thing I think we don't appreciate and often enough is that systemic JA may go away. So the parents that are here, you know, we wish your children would get better. But in fact, in the large majority of cases, in fact, at least in half, it sort of does. So the longest series is this one here from Selvag, um, a 30-year follow-up on patients. There's only 12 in this series. But of those 12, 10 were in disease-free remission 30 years later with off therapy. So, that's a very unusual thing for an auto-inflammatory disease or any genetic disease to do. So our thoughts in this area started with a patient anecdote in 2006, an eight-year-old girl with six months of fever, rash, no other diagnosis on extensive evaluation. She had sedrate, she had ferritin, she had no arthritis yet. We know that sometimes can lag. Other options were not great. non had not worked. She was already obese. We didn't want to use steroids. She had fatty liver. We couldn't use methotrexate. So we started anakinra monotherapy. This is just after Virginia had published her paper, and she went into immediate complete remission and has been there since. So that was the nucleus, the index case, of a series we pulled together, which is very sort of stupid. We sent a little email out online saying, anybody have any patients that treat with Anakin or early? We pulled together 46 patients from four countries, and uh, of which the enter criteria were a clinical diagnosis of systemic JAA and treatment with Anakin as part of the initial DMARD regimen. And that we 10 that were on Anakin or monotherapy, and a lot of them were on Anakin with other things. And so intrinsically, this kind of series is always going to be messy. And in fact, it's messy, but I think the, in, in the end, it ends up being sort of fairly compelling. So these were, uh, the median start time to therapy was pretty soon, so with le less than three months since onset of diagnosis. And we had about 60% complete responders. Um, almost all the rest of them had at least a partial response. And one patient had no response, but that patient got it for a week 
in MAS in the ICU, and then they stopped. So the um, among the uh, so what is remarkable that almost all the patients responded in terms of their fevers. So we talk a lot about heterogeneity of disease, but in fact, in really early onset systemic JA, there isn't that much heterogeneity in this question. There are some non-responders, but they are few, and it is large that the, the homogeneity of the response to fevers, at least, is very striking. So among the 10, mono, the 10 monotherapy patients, there was eight of them had complete response, and there was only about 10% persistent synovitis compared to 50% historical control. So it looked impressive, but it has all the flaws of retrospective series, including selection bias, partial data collection. So we were, we were not the only ones thinking about this, and in fact, uh, you know, the people at Utrecht were thinking of it probably before we were, and they were thinking of it better, and they did a nice, nice control trial. Bas is, is here, and, and uh, Nico's here responsible for this very important perspective observation where they took everybody, <laughs> 21 patients, and they put them on, uh, all, all but one of them failed indocin, and then put them on an akinor at a standard regimen, and they found very impressive here ACR 90 responses. So really a fantastic series that completely overlapped our data in terms of the response rate. So very convincing uh, without that same selection bias that we necessarily had. And then this has been repeated by uh, by Fabrizio's group in Rome, looking at the patients treated with anakinra, about half of them responded, and the biggest factor of when they res of the driving response was time from onset to receiving anakinra. So the patient with inactive disease got the disease got the drug really early, 1.9 months in, compared to the patients who didn't respond fully were 24 five months in. So same association. So early treatment looks like it's better than later treatment, or at least it's good. So, so we've termed this informally the window of opportunity, sort of a used, overused phrase, but I think useful here as a concept. So I think it's reasonable to ask, is there a window of opportunity for IL-1 blockade and systemic JA? And I think the answer is a solid maybe. That is, early treatment correlates with good response. That is, there's over 90% fever response, over 75% ACR 90s are better, less than 20% persistent course, compared to late treatment, which often has a partial, only a partial response. And I think there are, of course, obvious caveats to this. One is that this is observational, uncontrolled data. Uh, we know some patients get better on their own, so maybe we just happen to select those patients. Um, we, it's totally unfair to com directly compare early patients to patients who fail other things. That's, we know that patients who fail one thing will more likely fail another, and so it's really apples and oranges comparison. And then I think there's canakinumab data we should pay careful attention to. So we all know this very important canakinumab trial in which uh, patients were, were given canakinumab, and you see there are about 50% ACR90 responses, really excellent responses in this condition, um, um, including among patients who had had prior anakinra. Um, and in data that, as far as I know, has not been published, but has been presented in poster form, uh, the time from onset to, of disease to start of canakinumab did not make any difference at all. So this is less, this is a slide I think I have from Alexi, that this is the uh, less than six months, six months to four years, or greater than four years, ACR 30, 50, 70, 90, completely overlapping responses. So this is not what you'd expect if there was this really early window. But, you know, is six months early? I, you know, I don't know. That's, that's a, there, I think those important questions remain. So if there is a window, which I think we have to say we don't know yet, um, how does it happen? And I think that we, we, when we go back to look at this evolutionary diagram, we should remember that Although there's an innate immunity and adaptive immunity, these guys have co-evolved, and they're talking to each other all the time in many different ways. And so in that case, in that context, I think mice have something to teach us. So uh, there's a Iwakura's group in, in, in Japan came up with a model of arthritis based on the lack of IL-1 receptor antagonists. So this is the endogenous anakinna that's sort of missing in a set of these mice. And in a certain background, if you delete this, those mice get... Uh, arthritis in almost all mice. It's a bad erosive arthritis. There's a diagram. You can see here how thick those paws are compared to those paws. And so this is classic. Of course, this is, in a way, for us arthritis biologists, and that's what I am, uh, this was totally obvious. IL-1 is a classic arthritogenic cytokine. It, it if activates endothelial cells. It involves, is involved in leukocyte recruitment, osteoclast differentiation, fibroblast activation. Is, of course, it's going to cause arthritis. That's the kind of cytokine it is. But in fact, this arthritis is entirely T cell dependent. That is, it's transferable to mice by T cells, um, even if they don't have mice don't have antibodies or they don't have. Uh, it's, it's only the T cells that have the defect. And in that context, it's actually totally dependent on IL seventeen. 
which are sort of very striking responses for what should have been, ought have been, an innate immune cytokine mediated arthritis, which turns out to be really entirely mediated by lymphocytes. So in a way, I think it's important to remember in this context that IL-1 is not just an adapt innate immune cytokine. It is a cytokine that programs adaptive immunity, specifically in terms of Th17 and Tregs, where now the, I'll put the little icon here at the bottom, which is indicating I'm talking about mice. So be careful about what this means about humans. But you know, just in the way we heard from Pierre earlier, uh, in this context, uh, IL-1 drives cytokines which cause in, uh, naive T cells to express the IL-1 receptor. They then become susceptible to IL-1 influences, and, and that stops them going toward Tregs and forces them through Th17 cells. Th17 cells, driven by IL-1, make more IL-17. So this is sort of this IL-1-17 arm. Um, but it's not just Th17 cells, or not, not even principally Th17 cells in this model. In fact, if you, the Irokura group recently developed a mouse that, has, that expresses an IL-17 reporter, and they looked in the, in the joints, and they found that most of the cells were actually gamma-delta cells, not straightforward Th17 cells. So it's an interesting paradigm. And in fact, IL-1 plays a role here, too, showing that uh, here the gamma-delta T cells, IL-23, turns out drives expression of IL-1 receptor, which then allows them to become susceptible to IL-1 to make IL-17. So again, IL-1 plays an important role here in driving this Th17 type response. So that leads to a, a kind of a different way of thinking about this disease potentially. So you can certainly have a process here where IL-1 is a bad actor in the joints leading to inflammation. But then as you bathe in this IL-1 signaling rich environment, you then get also a total distortion of your adaptive immunity both in terms of how, much, how many of your T cells go to Th17 cells, how many of them become Tregs, can Tregs turn to Th17s, T, is Treg function blocked by IL-1 functioning? So there's a lot of ways that you're, you mess with your adaptive immune system in this here too. So one possibility, and it's still a hypothesis that has not by any means been confirmed, um, is that IL-1 early does this, and IL-1 late, and then drives the system to this point, and once you've mutated your system, you're no longer susceptible to IL-1, which would be consistent with the observation that IL-1 works great here, stops this from happening. But if you block it here, once the process is already out of the barn, it doesn't work as well. So caveats and questions. Not a perfect answer. Um, we don't know why some patients progress to arthritis and others don't. Um, we don't know why uh, some chronic SJA patients, who should by all rights be in this TH17 mode, respond well. Um, we don't know why some acute patients don't respond at all, which happens. Um, and so one idea we're grasping to here is heterogeneity of patients. But I think we have to be really careful about that. So in a way, yes, heterogeneous for sure, no doubt. We all are. We are, as mouse biologists like to say, humans are outbred, so we're going to be different. Um, but we have to think that almost 90%, you 95% of the systemics respond to IL-1 early. So in terms of, at least in terms of fever. So something's homogenous, reasonably homogenous about them early. Um, what, about the, what about the cause of persistent or recurrent inflammation? You know, I think we know that patients, even when they look like they're chronic burned out, they may still have a positive dimer, they may still have a ferritin higher than you think. They're not really burned out in terms of their systemic phase. Um, and the disease can relapse. We also see if patients who have relapsing disease after years of inactivity adults who have adult onset stills that you query, and then when they were children, they had something which sounded very similar. We don't know uh, the role of monocyte abnormalities. So for example, what Betsy's working on in terms of, or we don't know the role of NK abnormalities in this model. And we don't really know why this transition, if you just have a lot of IL-1 around, you should drive an IL-17 driven arthritis, why doesn't that seem to occur as much in other diseases where the signal's even stronger, perhaps, like CAPS or FMF? Although there's some evidence that these cells, these patients also become Th17 rich. So is SJA a, a, uh, ongoing, an, an auto-inflammatory disease? Don't know. Um, not a foregone conclusion, I think. I think that we all know, in, in, not just in not rheumatology, but in all of medicine, there's a balance between innate and an active immunity as or more auto-inflammatory, more autoimmune. And some things are clearly on one end of the spectrum, like FMF and NOMID. Things like myasthenia gravis are probably all the other way. You know, there's our, our regular arthritic diseases are somewhere on the spectrum. Where's SJA? Maybe one place, maybe multiple places. Certainly more to this end than to that end. But straightforward auto-inflammatory disease, like it says in most of the reviews nowadays, not so clear. We have to be a little more careful. So what, is that, what implications does that have in the last 15 seconds? So, the uh, 
One possible is early therapy may be better, um, especially for IL-1. That's an increasingly common practice. Um, we don't know whether IL-1 or IL-6, maybe both could be equal, maybe other pathways could be equally good. We know it's not yet su supported by conclusive evidence. There are a couple trials going on in the US. I don't know what's going on in Europe, but the Anastils trial from SOBI is, is ramping up. There's a call trial called FROST, which is an observational trial in CARA. Um, and then I think if, if IL-17 turns out to be relevant for the chronic arthritis, maybe IL-17 is an interesting target, which is my segue to Pierre. There, thanks.